guys it's and it's gone and today we'll be looking at my grades for every team's trade deadline in 2021. every year we see teams reach for veterans with hope that they will provide major league impact on a contending team and send back prospects in return this year was particularly exciting and was also interesting in terms of who was selling and buying it was also intriguing to see the market for players heat up as the clock struck closer to the deadline we saw a flurry of moves, then some were better than others. These grades are for trades long term and short term, and will be my personal evaluation on the prospects received so we could possibly have very different, differing opinions on a trade, depending on how we view the prospects. The grades will be on a standard A to F scale, with A being the highest and F being the lowest. Before we get onto the video, could you guys please hit the subscribe button? Currently, only 3% of people who watch my videos are subscribed. So if y'all do, not only would it help me grow my channel, but I'd also very much appreciate it. And without further ado, let's get on to the video. Starting alphabetically and with the Arizona Dimebacks, they get a C. They did what they had to do, shedding anyone with an expiring contract in Eduardo Escobar and Joaquim Soria for basically no decent prospects. I think that Escobar could have been traded for more, especially if it was traded earlier in the year. I also think that the Dimebacks should have sold more and to give and given up more veterans, such as outfielder David Peralta, to clear up space and get the youth movement started, as they probably aren't going to compete anytime soon with the state of their team and the competitiveness of their division. Next up is the Atlanta Braves, and they get a B- for acquiring a lot of players and rebuilding their entire outfield. They traded for Richard Rodriguez, which was a great trade as they acquired a solid reliever with many years left on his contract, which should help more once the team runs it back next year. However, I find it puzzling why the Braves went after so many rental players when they stand very little of a chance to complete for a playoff spot with Acuna gone. Peterson, Duvall, and Soler are all set to be free agents even though they cost, even though they costed just a little bit to acquire them, it makes no sense for them to buy here. An ideal trade line for them, in my opinion, would have been to sell off some expiring contracts such as Charlie Morton and see what sticks in 2022 once the team reloads. The Baltimore Orioles get a C-plus for this trade deadline. Their only move of any significance was flipping Freddie Galvis for a 23-year-old reliever and Tyler Birch. That was a good move as they already seemed to find their shortstop for the rest of the year in Ramon Urias, and he was on the last year of his contract anyways, so he's gonna probably going to walk for nothing. However, they spent the rest of the trade deadline hanging guys like Trey Mancini and John Means and didn't trade any of them. John Means is excusable because he's going to be under contract until after 2023 and the Orioles are said to start competing again, but Mancini is going to be entering the final year of arbitration next year, making him not really in the Orioles window of contention. If he gets traded in the offseason, then this grade gets improved, but I think Mancini's highest value was right now at the trade deadline. The Boston Red Sox get a C plus for this trade deadline, and I explained more in my winners and losers of the trade deadline video, but the Red Sox needed starting pitching and didn't acquire any big names. There are some low price veteran starters on the market, such as John Lester, Morel Kelly, and Tyler Anderson, would have been solid mid to back end starting, starting pitchers, and they would have costed almost nothing. The only reason this trade isn't wor this grade isn't worse is that they acquired Schwarber for basically nothing, which is a good low risk, high reward move, but they did that without making any other big moves, so they're doomed to fail in the playoffs to a team that did make big moves. Like the Red Sox, I've talked about the Cubs more extensively in my other trade deadline video, and I give them a solid A. I really like that they're able to just tear off the wound and trade the players with expiring contracts. Worst case scenario would be that they just leave all leave in free agency or even that they're all re-signed to bloated contracts hindering them in the future. The prospects that they got in return aren't the best because the players that they traded away were rentals, but the sheer amounts of them will mean that at least some of them will turn out to be solid and will be contributors. The Cubs, being a big market team, can financially reset and let their big veteran contracts such as Hayward off the books and spend money once the prospects are all ready to compete. The White Sox get a D-plus for not really filling the hole at second base and making a somewhat puzzling trade for Craig Kimbrell. There were many quality second basemen and the prices weren't that high in Escobar, so why didn't the White Sox just get in? The second base hole was the only going to be temporary too, as Nick Madrigal was going to come back next year. However, he was traded along with Cody Hewer for in the Kimbrell trade. Now, unless they have a plan for getting a generational second baseman within the next year, this trade will come down as a loss. To add insult to injury, 
The White Sox don't even have a strong need for bullpen help with Liam Hendricks and Garrett Crochet in the back end. The Reds had a quiet but effective trade deadline acquiring relief pitchers in which they desperately needed and also did not have to pay that much either, and for that they deserve a B+. They acquired Michael Givens, Justin Wilson, and Luis Sessa and gave up basically nothing, just a few minor league pitchers. The trade definitely makes them better and doesn't sacrifice them long term. Even though the Reds have a long shot for making the playoffs, it won't be because of this deadline. The only reason why this do doesn't get a higher grade is because I think that they cost possibly could have gotten an elite starting pitcher like Max Scherzer, and that would have really pushed their deadline over the top. The Indians get a C for their pretty puzzling trade deadline. They dumped Eddie Rosario in what was purely a salary dump as they acquired Pablo Sandoval and then immediately released him. The other move of any significance that they made was acquiring Miles Straw for Phil Maton and Yaner Diaz. This move may help their relatively weak outfield long term, but it's a long shot. This is not the fault of Cleveland's general managing, and the blame is placed solely on their owner. As a fan of a relatively small market team, it irks me to see how low an owner can bring down a team. The Colorado Rockies get an F, and this will be the only F on this list, and this deadline was pretty bad. I doubt the Rockies could pr get a better package from John Gray and Trevor Story with the 35th and 36th overall picks, even with the declining value of rentals. What should have happened was trading Trevor and John immediately after trading Nolan Arenado. Their value would have been so much higher as they get a full season instead of half a season. They also should have traded Ramon Marquez as he's one of the best pitchers this year and has a lot of team control left, making the rebuild that much easier as they get great prospects. I brought up some other points in my other trade deadline video too as well. The Detroit Tigers get a B- for me and that is only because they didn't trade Jonathan Scope who's on the last year of his deal, but if they're able to re-sign him for another year, they should be just fine. The only trade was trading Daniel Norris to the Brewers. There are some relatively small talks for getting Trevor Story, but that was nothing more than a pipe dream and it probably wasn't going to help the team anyways. The team is beginning to click and I'm glad that they didn't trade any away any of the main pieces of their core with top prospects like Spencer Torkelson coming up in the minors within the next year or two, the Tigers could be on the other side of the deadline and making phone calls for veterans. The rebuild is almost over, Tiger fans. The Houston Astros get a B plus for beefing up their bullpen and only get having to give up some prospects along with young players like Abraham Torrell and Miles Straw. In return, they received all-star closer Kendall Graveman along with underrated relievers and Yimi Garcia and Phil Martin. The Astros have a relatively weak bull bullpen beforehand, with their only good reliever being Ryan Presley, and that only got weaker with Pedro Baez on the IL. They turned one of their weaknesses into strengths and didn't have to give up that much. The only reason this team isn't higher is they should have pushed for a quality outfielder like Starling Marte and headlined a package of Forrest Whitley for him. The Kansas City Royals get an incomplete grade for making only one big trade in trading Danny Duffy to the Dodgers for two players to be named later. Those players will probably get better the more innings that Danny pitches for the D Dodgers, but the downside is that Danny's on the aisle and may not pitch that many. They also traded Solaire for a high A reliever, but I guess it's better than nothing as they're probably going to release him anyways. This was about what we expected from the Royals as they're also nearing the end of their rebuild and we're expected to not make any huge trades as they already have the main pieces of their core, either in their farm system or already on the squad. The Los Angeles Angels got a B for this trade deadline as they made two relatively minor moves and they just did fine in terms of those moves. They were able to flip Andrew Heaney to the Yankees and got a surprisingly decent young player given how poorly that Heaney's performed this year and given the fact that he's also a rental. They also acquired Tony Watson who's a decent reliever and will definitely help the Angels in the short term and they didn't give up any away anyone who would sacrifice them long term. While I'd love to see some long-term big moves by the Angels at the trade deadline, they did just fine, I guess. The Dodgers get an A+, and I talked about them more in my 5 winners and losers video, but they possibly had a d trade deadline that they will look back on as the final piece for their dynasty. They acquired Max Scherzer, Trey Turner, and Danny Duffy, which were all great moves in both the short term and long term as they have the money capital to re-sign them all. As for the prospects they give up, Yes, they are good, but with the Dodgers development team in both the minors and major leagues, they're expendable on such a good team. Even if guys like Kieber Uriz turn into stars on the Nationals, no amount of prospects can win you a ring, which is what the Dodgers put themselves in position to do. 
The Marlins get a B plus for getting some good value out of some veterans with expiring contracts in Adam Duvall, Starling Marte, John Curtis, and Yimi Garcia, and got some major league ready young players that they can use for experimenting with for the rest of the year, such as Jesus Lazardo. Kim Ng did a great job in realizing that they weren't going to compete for a postseason spot despite the feeling that they're just one piece away and capitalized on getting some value for expiring contracts, getting some intriguing cost controlled guys to work with. The Marlins are just a year away from contention and it could be thanks to the contributions made from the hordes of young players acquired at this year's trade deadline. The Brewers get an A- for making two extremely smart moves at the trade deadline. They get two quality players in Eduardo Escobar and John Curtis and gave up basically nothing to get them. In return for an all-star and a near all-star, they had to give up catchers Peyton Henry and Cooper Hummel and second baseman Alberto Caprin. Despite having one of the first farm system, worst farm systems in the league, they didn't have to give up any of their top guys to make their team better and they became one of the dark horses in the National League. The only way this trade deadline could have been better is if they got Trevor Story, but obviously the Rockies were not budging on their packages that they had to get, and this trade deadline was great already. The Minnesota Twins decided to sell on their middling team, and for pulling the plug, they were rewarded with a haul and a half. They get uh, they, for that they get a B plus. Nelson Cruz was a great player to be traded, and they got two quality, young, cost-controlled pitchers in Joe Ryan and Drew Strotman. We should fill out the back of the Twins rotation for years to come, but have the upside of being front of the rotation starters. The big trade became when they flipped Jose Barrios to the Rays for number two overall pick Austin Martin and Simeon Woods Richardson. The Twins said that, that if they weren't going to trade Jose, unless they got blown away with an offer, and they certainly did right the here. The Twins are getting a slight retooling, but should have multiple quality players coming up soon thanks to this deadline. The Mets made two moves, acquiring three players in Rich Hill, Javier Baez, and Trevor Williams. And the best player that they had to give up was Pete, Peter Crow Armstrong, who was a fringe top 100 prospect. For that, they get an A- in their trade deadline grade. The Mets did a good job at targeting players that had a low stock value such as Baez and got quality players for a lower cost. The Mets lock up the NL East with these moves, especially since nobody in their division made any significant moves like they did. While these are all short-term moves, they can easily become long-term moves if they are signed in contract extensions, and if guys like Baez resign, then this turns into an A+. The Yankees, while not, having, while not getting the biggest fish in the market like in Trey Turner, got many fish and they didn't have to give up many quality prospects for that and they get an A. Many people thought it, that if the Yankees were going to be sellers going into the trade deadline, or possibly even make some ma minor buying moves, but they bought and bought hard and surprised many people with the returns that they had to give get those players. They were able to get all-stars Anthony Rizzo and Joey Gallo and not have to part with their top prospects like Jason Dominguez, Clark Schmidt, Daivi Garcia, Oswald Peralza, and Anthony Volpe. They, they had some problems before ending their luxury tax issue, but that's been solved by giving up some relievers and having the teams trading the players pay their salary for the rest of that year. This trade deadline has the possibility to go down in ages as one of the best in the Yankees' modern history, especially if they can re-sign their guys. The Oakland Athletics get a B for making a flurry of moves, but headlined by grabbing the probably the best outfielder not including Chris Bryan and Starling Marte. In the trade, they had to give up one of the best young pitchers in the league in Jesus Lazardo, which is a win-win, as the Athletics get a starting center fielder and the Marlins get another young piece to work with. The Jan Gums trade was fine, and they didn't have to give up that much, but the trade that I really don't like is the Andrew Chafin trade. Chafin is a decent reliever and also is a rental, so it shouldn't really have that much value, but the Athletics gave up out outfielder Greg Dietschman, who's young and raking in AAA and seems like a solid major league starter. This grade could also go down if they fail to re-sign Starling long-term. The Philadelphia Phillies get a B-plus and acquired a bevy of pitchers from the Rangers and also acquired shortstop Freddie Galvis from the Orioles for just a reliever. They were able to trade for Hans Kraus, who's a decent young starting pitcher, Ian Kennedy, a great reliever, Kyle Gibson, and a great, a great starter, for Spencer Howard, who's a decent prospect, and Josh Grenzner and Kevin Gowdy. There's not really much to say about this. The Phillies are probably not going to make the playoffs, and they just made some minor moves. The Pittsburgh Pirates did what the Dimebacks did and sold anyone with an expiring contract in what looks like a long rebuild. However, unlike the Dimebacks, they get a B-plus for the haul that they got for trading away Richard Rodriguez, Tyler Anderson, and Adam Frazier. In return, they get a bunch of 
a great prospects headlined by Bryce Wilson, who made his that ama- amazing postseason start against the Dodgers, and to Paca Marcano, who's a top 100 prospect for Adam Frazier. While there are some talks for getting outfielder Brian Reynolds away, he's still a young player with many years left on his contract and could be traded later. Overall, a great deadline by the Pirates. The San Diego Padres get a C- in their trade deadline by making a relatively confusing trade for Adam Frazier. While the trade by itself was pretty good, they don't need a second baseman as they already have Drake Co- Jake Cronenworth, and it's not like they can shift him over to shortstop as they have some guy in Fernando Tatis Jr. However, what makes their deadline pretty bad is their stillness at the actual deadline. With some big moves in the offseason and in the regular season, they need to back it up and go all in, which is what they showed earlier. But with the Giants and Dodgers making moves, they need to go all in in the NL West arms race, which is what they didn't do. And they already went too far to turn away now. It's championship or bust, and they didn't do anything to improve their championship hopes. The Giants get an A for getting Chris Bryan and not having to give up any prospects that they will regret so far. Now, that doesn't mean that the prospects that they gave up have no chance of becoming stars, but they don't have the best as they're only the ninth, the best ones, the ninth ranked prospect. In return, they get an all-star who can probably re-sign with the team as they're going to unlock some money coming up with the veterans coming off the books. They were also able to dump Tony Watson on the Angels, which is a surprisingly, and they got a surprisingly decent return for a rental. And he's also not pitching that well. The Mariners get a C and had a pretty puzzling trade deadline as they traded their all-star closer in Kendall Graveman, despite being 8 games over 500 at the time and looking like they might make a push for the second wildcard slot. While Kendall Graveman trade might be good on paper, it absolutely killed the team's momentum which is the worst at a pivotal time like this. There were literally players crying, so the GM promised some big moves. Fans and players alike began to suspect some of the biggest names on the market, such as Trevor Story, but instead they got Tyler Anderson and Jose Castillo, which is a huge letdown. They may have been better if they just stayed put and didn't trade anybody at all. The Cardinals were like the Phillies and had a relatively boring trade deadline as they and they get a C plus for their moves. They bought for John Lester and J.A. Hat. The J.A. Hat move was a decent move as they acquired a quality player and didn't really have to give up anything of that value prospect wise, although they did have to give up reliever John Grant Gant. However, the John Lester trade is a bit questionable. It's not just from a former Cub Cardinal stance. They had to give up outfielder Lane Thomas, who's a quality young player, even though he struggled in the majors. For a team that looks like it's going to be on the outside looking in come playoff time, that is not the type of trade you want to make, even if John, even that John Lester is a rental. The Tampa Bay Rays had a quality trade deadline that went under the radar because of the big moves that happened late, later in the deadline, and they deserve an A-. Some of the main pieces that they got were Jordan Lupo, Nelson Cruz, and Rich Hill. In return, they didn't have to part with any of their top prospects and had a loaded enough farm system to part with some of their depth without hurting that much in the long term. The Rays finally get their face of the franchise in Cruz, which is something that they've been lacking for a long time. This was a very Rays-like deadline as they fly under the radar while being an incredibly good team in a dark course or going out of the AL. The Rangers are currently in the middle of their rebuild and are trading away guys who are going to not be on the team when they begin to become good again. So that meant guys like Joey Gallo and Ian Kennedy were out. The Ian Kennedy trade was a good trade as they were able to flip him along with a couple other pitchers for a a a prospect package headlined by Spencer Howard. And the Joey Gallo trade was decent enough, I guess. They got, they chose quantity over quality, but I think when you're looking at prospects, you want to get upside, and I think that they could have gotten a little bit more for the Joey Gallo trade. Overall, the Rangers get a B plus for their trade deadline. I talked about the Blue Jays more extensively in my five winners and losers at the trade deadline video, but the Blue Jays get a C for their trade deadline move. Their main move was getting Jose Barrios, who's an amazing pitcher, I have to admit, and he's also not a uh, rental, and is and he's going to have a year left after this. But he, they had to give up their number two overall pick and their top prospect in Austin Martin for him, along with Simeon Woods Richardson. Now, unless the Blue Jays make the playoffs, which I don't think is going to happen, this trade will come down as a loss, regardless of if the prospects pan out or not. Now, the Blue Jays are probably not going to make the playoffs this year because the AL is so tough. Next year is anyone's guess, but Jose Brios was just a mad trade, and that's why they're getting a C+. 
Last but not least is the Washington Nationals, and like the Cubs, they sh- they did extremely well at the trade deadline, ripping off the wound and just beginning their rebuild by jump starting it by trading away guys. They knew they weren't going to sign Trey Turner, so they capitalized on his value and they got a hole and a half for him. Their prospects were mainly Kieber Ruiz and Josiah Gray. With those prospects, they should kickstart their rebuild, and it might take only four years, three years, instead of the usual five to six years, and they can focus on rebuilding through trades and rather than the draft, as most other teams do. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember, if you enjoyed, please like, share, and subscribe, and watch my five winners and losers video where I go more extensively into some other teams. And uh, if you guys could also watch my trade videos, I'd be greatly appreciated as well. See what I got right and wrong. Bye.